Here's the key to lead the way with what to do with your money, what to do with your time, what to do with your resources. Lead your family. Help lead some people you know out of the oblivion of desperation into faith and security. Leadership is the great challenge of the last of the 90s and the first part of the new century. The challenge is in science. The challenge is in education. You know, we've got to straighten out our educational program or we'll fall behind among the nations of the world. It's going to take some incredible leadership. Politics. Boy, it would be great to be proud instead of embarrassed. Leaders in industry. Sales management, you name it. The leadership role is really challenging for the next century. Here's one of the greatest challenging roles in leadership, parenting. One of the greatest challenges of leadership is parenting. Unless we take our children by the hand and strengthen the family foundation, I'm telling you, the, the, the nation is shaky. That's where it all begins, to where finally we don't have children that go to school and blow everybody away. This starts with parenting. My father had a simple little rule. Son, if you get in trouble in school, when you get home, it's called double trouble. <laughs> Anybody ever have that method? <laughs> double trouble if you get in trouble with school. We don't go sue the school. If you get in trouble in school, home, double trouble. School, home, double trouble. Is it not interested in double trouble. So now... Here's what leadership is. The challenge to be more than mediocre. The challenge to step up to a new level, a new dimension. And here's what this new dimension has. Opportunity and responsibility. But who wouldn't want the responsibility along with the opportunity if it builds an extraordinary life? You wouldn't want it any other way. Here's some of the refinement of leadership. Now, I've got to go through these notes rather quickly. The refinement of leadership. Make this list. Learn to be strong but not rude. Some people mistake rudeness for strength. Rudeness we don't need. Strength we do need. Here's the next one. Learn to be bold but not a bully. We need to boldly seize the day, boldly seize the opportunity, boldly seize the chance. But we don't need bullies. We don't need anybody to push anybody around. There's a whole new level of leadership, especially like in network marketing. You've got to learn it anyway if you want to succeed. But, but it, it, it'll work anywhere. A new method of leadership. Here's what it is. Leadership by invitation. Not leadership by threat. Not leadership by aggravation. Not leadership by intimidation. That now shows the weakness of the leader. That now shows ego at work instead of skills. But it's leadership by invitation. Invite somebody to a better way of doing things. Here's what else it's called. Leadership by inspiration. Inspiring somebody to make the necessary changes to move up or to get the job done. As leaders, we inspire. As leaders, we entice. As leaders, we invite. Invite, entice, inspire. Not threaten. New kind of leadership. Be bold but not a bully. Next. Be kind but not weak. Some people mistake weakness for kindness. And it's a great mistake. Kindness isn't weak. Kindness is a certain unusual strength. But don't say, I must be weak in order to be kind. And the answer is no. Sometimes you have to be unusually strong to be kind. Somebody coined the expression, tough love. Love that, that really tells the truth and levels, sometimes with a broken heart, but whatever has to be said has to be said. Kind but not weak. Here's another one that's excellent. Be thoughtful but not lazy. We need to give thought, but we also need to take action. You need to dream without just being a dreamer. Head in the clouds, yes, dreaming, lofty dreams, but feet on the ground. Here's two or three more. These are excellent. Be humble but not timid. 
Some people mistake timidity for humility. Humility is a virtue. Timidity is an illness. It can be cured. It can be managed. And if you are timid, you've got to work on it. I'm telling you, it's a weakness. It's not a virtue. But you must turn your timidity into strength and keep working on it and keep working on it until finally you have driven it into such a small corner that it does not devastate your life anymore. Now you use it as a source of teaching. I used to be so shy and so timid, but I worked on it and I worked on it and I've driven it into such a small corner, it doesn't dominate my life anymore. It's still there, but it doesn't dominate. That's what's important. But humility is a virtue. Expands your ability to understand the vastness of it all and how small we are in relation to everything. Humility that causes you to get on your knees and talk to a child without any fear of how you look. Humility. To understand, yes, humans are unique, but in the vast space of it all, we're all pretty small. Yes, we know, but what we don't know is so much greater than what we do know. Here's a couple of more. Be proud without being arrogant. There's something to be said for team pride and community pride. Company pride, personal pride. But don't cross the line to where you're being proud now becomes arrogance. Pride we need, arrogance we don't. Arrogance is usually the childish attempt to make up for lack of self-worth. The childish attempt to make up for lack of self-worth has a tendency to create arrogance. And you know the worst kind of arrogance? Arrogance from ignorance. That's the worst kind. If a guy's smart and arrogant, we can tolerate that. But if a guy's dumb and arrogant, that's hard to take. So now... All leaders must learn the basic laws so they can use them as illustrations as well as use them for productivity. Here's the first of the basic laws. Whatever you sow, you reap. Now, here's another way to put it on the positive side. In order to reap, you must sow. Reaping is reserved for those who sow, who plant. To deserve the harvest, you must plant the seed, take care of it in the summer, carefully harvest it, and then do wise things with the harvest. Now, here's the rest of the law of sowing and reaping. If you sow good, you reap good. If you sow bad, you reap bad. You can't sow bad and hope for good. You can't plant weeds and hope for flowers. It works both positive and negative. Now, here's something else about the law of sowing and reaping. You don't reap what you sow. That's important to understand. You reap much more than what you sow. If you just reap what you sow, what's the exercise for? No, we don't reap what we sow. We reap much more than what we sow. Now, here's what's important to understand on that. It works both positive and negative. The old prophet said, if you sow to the wind, you don't reap a wind. You reap a whirlwind. You've got to be careful sowing to the wind. It doesn't come back as a wind. It comes back as a whirlwind. That's on the negative side. But now it also works on the positive side. If you plant a cup of corn, how much do you get back? A cup? No, a bushel for the cup. You get back much more than what you plant. That's the reason for planting for the increase, positive, negative. Now, here's the next key to the law of sowing and reaping. Sometimes it doesn't work at all. Everybody has to understand. The farmer plants the crop in the spring, takes care of it all summer, is an honorable man, loves his family, is a decent citizen. But the day before he sends the combines into the field, a hailstorm comes along and beats his crop into the ground, and it's gone, it's lost. So this time it didn't work. So now what must the farmer do? He's got to decide whether to do it again or not. Shall we take another chance in the next spring? We would advise him to do so, even though he lost everything in the last harvest. 
and it didn't work. You didn't reap what you sowed. But here's the law of averages. Here's the odds. More often than not, you reap what you sow. More often than not, you'll have a harvest if you plant in the spring. There's no guarantee, but more often than not. And guess what more often than not is? Pretty good odds. It's better than Las Vegas. Incredible. The law of sowing and reaping. Next, one of the most important laws to learn is the law of averages. If you do something often enough, you'll get a ratio of results. Once you understand that, you know, the world is yours. Learning to employ people in the unique thing called the law of averages is stunning in its result in terms of fortune, future. Let's say you're in sales and you talk to 10 people just getting started. If you talk to 10, you get one. We now have what we call the beginning of a ratio. Talk to 10, nine say no, one says yes. I'll buy your product, I'll take your service. Somebody says, well, one out of 10 isn't that good. Well, you're just getting started. Because here's what happens with the law of averages. Once it starts, it tends to continue. If you talk to 10 and get one, chance is excellent. If you talk to 10 more, you'll get another one. In baseball, we call it batting average. Swing 10 times, get a hit. Swing 10 times, get a hit. Nobody bats 9 out of 10. You can make $6 million a year and not bat 9 out of 10, nor 8 out of 10, nor 7 out of 10, nor 5 out of 10, nor 4 out of 10, nor 3 out of 10. Some of these guys are getting five, six, seven million dollars a year batting two, three out of ten. So you don't have to be perfect here. All you have to do is understand the law of averages. Now, even if you're only getting one out of ten, you can now start to compete. If you've been here a long time, you can get nine out of ten. I just joined. I can only get one out of ten. I'm telling you, if we have a contest, I will beat you. Say, well, you just started. How could you beat me? It's very simple. If we have a 30-day run on a contest or a 60-day run... While you talk to 10 and get 9, I will talk to 100 and get 10. I win. <laughs> Isn't that clever? Here's what I do if I'm new. I make up in numbers what I lack in skill. I make up in numbers what I first lack in skill. Now, when my skills increase, I don't have to do 100 to get 10. Once you understand the law of averages, I'm telling you, it's so exciting to work with the law of averages. The law of averages works in our little money plan here. You know, chances are excellent if you have this little plan. I'm telling you, chances are excellent. It'll work, it'll work, it'll work. The ratios will work for you. Here's what else is exciting. The law of averages can be increased. At first, you only get one out of ten, but the better you get, the more skills you develop. Now you get two out of ten, and then three out of ten. And you don't need more than about two, three out of ten to get rich. In working with people, there's a unique story about the law of averages. It says the sower went out to sow the seed. Number one, he had excellent seed or a great story to tell and a good product to sell. And it says the, the sower was ambitious, got up early in the morning and went out to do the deal. So good seed, ambitious sower, and he starts to sow the seed. But here's what happens. Make the notes. The first part of the seed that he sowed, the birds got. And the birds are going to get some. John said, yes, I will come check out the meeting, see if that's an opportunity for me. He says, I will be there on Tuesday night. Tuesday night comes, John isn't there. Say, I wonder where he is. The birds. The <laughs> birds. Whatever form they come in. And he's not there. Somebody stole the seed. Somebody robbed him of the opportunity. Guess what you can do about it? Nothing. Well, you could chase birds, but I'm telling you, it's, a, it's not a good deal. You say, well, I'll get a hold of John, whoever talked him out of coming, I'll go straighten them out. I'm telling you, you've asked for more than you can handle. Here's what you should do. Here's what the sower did. He kept sowing the seed. Here's what you can do if you stay busy. Sow more than the birds can get. Just de depend on the law of averages. Not trying to straighten out every problem. So the birds are going to get some. Now it says he kept sowing the seed, and now the seed falls on rocky ground where the soil is shallow, and the little plant starts to grow, but the first hot day, it withers and dies. So make the note, the hot weather's going to get some. You recruit somebody, and they join, say, hey, I'm going to really do great here. And two days later, somebody says, boo, and they quit. They quit. The first hot day. 
they're gone. Say, what can you do about that? Nothing. Because if you start chasing, trying to fix this, I'm telling you, it's unfixable. But here's what you can do to fix your future. Keep doing like the sower did. He kept on sowing. And you can't be responsible for the shallow ground. That's somebody else's responsibility. So here's the third key now. He's keep sowing the seed, and now the seed falls on thorny ground. And this time the little plant starts to grow again, but the thorns choke it to death, and it dies. So make the note. The thorns are going to get some. Here's what it called the thorns in this little story. The cares of life, little duties, little distractions. I said, John, we had a meeting last night. How come you weren't here? John says, well, I can't make every meeting. I said, why not? He said, well, the screen door came off the hinges. You just can't let your house fall apart. You got to take time and fix, fix, fix. I can hear the thorns go, ah. <laughs> he said, some extra trash piled up in the garage. You just can't let mountains of trash pile up in your garage. I said, What can I do about that? Nothing. People let little things cheat them out of big opportunities. And sometimes it's a little heartbreaking to watch them. Especially if it's somebody you care about. But there are some things, remember, you can't straighten out. You just got to depend on something else for your fortune and your future. But now let's go to the rest of the story. Here's what it says. Finally, the sower keeps sowing the seed. Now it falls on good ground. Underline this, good ground. And it always will. If you keep sharing a good idea, it will someday fall on good ground. Productive ground, receptive ground, decision-making ground. Now, it was interesting, though, about the ground. Here's what it said about the ground. Some of this good ground now produced 30%, some produced 60%, and some produced 100%. What's that called? The law of averages. Everybody's not going to do the same. Everybody doesn't have the same ambitions. And you can't straighten this out now. You just have to take it like it comes. It's like the seasons. You can't rearrange them and say, I'll take two springs, three summers. And... No. You've got to take them like they flow. Okay. But now how do you get 100 percenters? Some will produce 100 percent. How do you get some 100 percenters? You got to go through the birds and you got to go through the hot weather and you got to go through the choking thorns and you got to sort of put up with those, you know, that haven't got much ambition, 30, 60 percenters, and you'll get some 100 percenters. The law of averages is, is at work in the university. Are there as many seniors as there are freshmen? You say, why is that? It, it's a mystery. The inevitable erosion of life says there's always going to be more freshmen than seniors. Not every race that started does everybody finish. The answer is no. Some people don't want to finish. Some people plant in the spring and leave in the summer. And you can't straighten that out. Here's what you can do. Keep telling the story. Keep sharing a good idea. And I'm telling you, it will work for you. So here's what we say. If you want a lot of graduating seniors, you must keep loading the freshman class. The law of averages. It's one of the greatest studies to make. It'll serve you well in your business career, your sales career, any kind of career. One more on the law of averages. There's an old rule, and it's been around a long time, that says 20% of the people do 80% of the business and 80% do 20%. And this is something you don't try to change or rearrange. It's part of the deal. Somebody says, well, I'll just fire the 80%. And say, no, because whoever's left, 20% of them will do 80% and 80 will do 20%. That's not something you mess with. Here's what these laws are. Something you work with, something you understand and you work with. 20 are going to do 80, and it works everywhere. Ask the minister of the church. Who puts up the money here to support the church? He says 20% of the people pick up 80% of the tab, and 80% pick up 20%. Americans paying taxes, what's the deal? 20% pay, 80% of the taxes, and 80% pay 20% of the taxes to run the federal government. This is not something you mess with. This is something you work with till you understand it. Well, how do you work with the 80-20? Here's what you got to do. Part of it's time management. You can only give 20% of your time to the 80% because they're only producing 20%. Now, you can give 80% of your time to the 
Now remember, the pull is in the opposite direction. Guess who wants 80% of your time? The wrong group. The wrong group. Now, not, this is not a moral question. The wrong group in terms of productivity and effectiveness in your business, your future. So what's the answer to that? Here's part of the answer. You can work individually with the 20%, but you can only work by group with the 80%. However, guess who usually wants your individual time? The 80%, and you cannot do that. Mary says, I've got a question, Mr. Rohn. I say, look, we're going to have a little training class on Saturday morning. Bring your question, and I'll answer it for everybody. She says, okay. Now, some, sometimes it's not that easy, <laughs> right? It, it's a little more challenging than that. But you've got, you got the key now. You've got the key now. This is the key. Okay. That's the law of averages. Here's the next important law called the Law of Faith. We covered it a little bit earlier in a fairly simple form. Faith is the ability to see things that don't yet exist. Faith, though, can turn difficulty into reality, positive reality. And I just want to give you this quick little line up here because it's so important to ponder and, and then work it. Here's what faith is for. Number one, faith is the ability to see it as it is. Faith doesn't mind seeing it as it is because faith is a miracle worker. Faith does not ignore the negative. Faith uses the negative because if there was no negative, there'd be no need for faith. If everything is okay, what would you need faith for? You need faith because it isn't okay. Now, what isn't okay? Who knows? The situation that isn't okay isn't okay. So here's what faith does. Number one, faith does not ignore the negative because faith now stands as the miracle worker if you let it work. So faith sees it as it is. If it's ugly, it's ugly. If it isn't working, it isn't working. If it's a mess, it's a mess. It doesn't hurt to call a mess a mess. You don't need to fancy it up here. If it's broke, it's broke. If it's miserable, it's miserable. Faith doesn't mind admitting that. Faith doesn't mind seeing that. Here's why. Number one, you can see it as it is. That's the beginning of faith, seeing it as it is. Now, here's the second step of faith. See it better than it is. Couldn't you see beyond the mess? The mess is for today. Couldn't you look into tomorrow? The answer is, yes, I guess I could look into tomorrow. Humans have this incredible ability to look into tomorrow, to look into next week. So we not only have the ability to see it as it is, the beginning of faith, but to see it better than it is. Dream the dreams, make the plans, visualize, use your imagination, see it better than it is. Now here's the third step that turns faith into reality. Make it better than it is. Faith now must be invested in the muscle. But if you invest faith now in the action, you can take any situation and make it better than it is. Next. In the beginning of faith, seeing it as it is. Don't see it worse than it is. Don't blow it out of proportion. Some people have this tendency to blow it all out of proportion. They say, well, it can't be that bad. If it's this bad, that's how bad it is. You don't need to multiply how bad it is by 10. That's not necessary here. Just as it is, that's the deal, as it is. Don't see it worse than it is. Now, here's the next unique key to faith. Don't see it for more than it can become. There's a thin line between faith and folly. Yes, it's possible to see yourself as a millionaire, but not overnight. Somebody says, well, yes, I can see that. Don't see it for more than it can become in a reasonable period of time. Yes, if it dropped out of the sky overnight, but that's not likely. But it's still possible to be a millionaire. It's still possible to be rich and wealthy, given a certain amount of time working with the law of averages and all the rest of the stuff we've talked about today. So don't see it for more than it can become so that you move into folly instead of faith. Plenty is possible without being foolish in your faith exercise. But now here's two more cautions. Number one, it might be worse than you first see it. You better look underneath. Because sometimes you just look at the surface. You better take a look. 
so that you can really see it as bad as it is. Not to overblow it now, but to make sure you see it as bad as it really is. Now here's the next one. Give yourself a chance to understand that it could be far more in the future than what you can first see. By faith, here's all you can see. Guess what the disciples were always saying? Increase our faith, increase our faith. The miracles that we see here gives us a certain amount of faith, but it looks like we need some more, we need some more. But you take the first step. Take the first step of what you can see, but give yourself a chance to be able to see it for more than what you first see it. On a foggy night, if all you can see is 100 feet, here's what you do. Walk that first 100 feet, now you can see another 100 feet. You can't see the 200 feet. But if you can see 100 feet, you walk the first 100 feet, now you can see another 100 feet. So I'm asking you to take the early steps of faith, whatever you can see it possible to become. Start believing that. Have faith for that. And I'm telling you, as that starts to exercise, you'll be able to see it for more and for more and for more. The possibilities will start to increase in your own imagination. Now make these notes. In leadership working with people, make these notes. Learn to work with the people who deserve it, not the people who need it. Because life operates by deserve. We studied that yesterday. Shouldn't the welfare people have said to Mary, Mary, look, you know, I know you need the $400, but from now on, when I come back here with the check for $400, here's a bucket of paint and a brush. This little fence around here and the posts on the door have got to be painted. She says, okay. Now, this little bit of paint's not worth $400, but it's a step to begin the process of what? Deserving it instead of just needing it. And you can start walking people away from need to deserve. Just let them take the early steps. Next time she comes and says, now, Mary, if this is done and the weeds are pulled and all this stuff is done and the painting is done and the weeds are done, and then you get the next 400. And now she's starting to walk out. She starts to feel better because she's beginning to deserve it, not just need it. Wow. Isn't that big time philosophy? That's it. Teaching people how to deserve it. Work with the people who deserve it. You say, Mary, if you take this step, I take two steps. And then if you take two more, I take four more. But if you don't take the first one, I don't step. You step, I step, right? You call, I call. You try, I try. You move, I move. Teaching people how to deserve it. It starts to accelerate self-esteem. You can't believe what a high the beginning of new self-esteem is. If a person hasn't had it for years and years and they've been beat down by their own philosophy and they've been beat down by everybody else, if you start them on the early steps that starts this process of self-esteem, self, the early self-esteem is even more valuable than the fortune because it comes at a necessary time. Leading people step by step into self-esteem and self-esteem leads to action, action leads to progress, progress leads to fortune. What else do you want? So work with the people who deserve it. Now, here's the next key. Show people how to deserve your time, how to deserve your help. Next, don't expect the pear tree to bear apples. Let people do whatever they can do. You can hang apples on a pear tree. Do all kinds of things. Put up a sign, this is an apple tree, and you get pears. So let people do whatever they can do, and let them change their mind. Let them grow and develop. Here's what I found. You cannot change people, but they can change themselves. The best you can do is inspire and hope, inspire and hope, teach and hope, teach and pray and hope and teach and pray and inspire and pray and hope. That's the best you can do. You can't get in there and change, but you can do your best to deliver the message that can create change if someone will accept it, if someone will do something about it, take the early baby steps to get started. And be happy with the smallest progress and give some rewards and pat on the back and a big smile and say, Mary, it's going to work for you. You've taken these two steps. I'm telling you, if you can take two steps, you could take 102. Wow. Next, all leaders must teach the fact that there is both good and evil. Here's the challenge for all of us to become the most of the good in us and the least of the bad. The most of the good and the least of the bad because that resides in all of us. That's the beginning we talked about the other day of civilization, becoming the most of the good and the least of the bad. But we must remember there is both good and evil. Remember the story about the frog and the scorpion? The frog and the scorpion appear on the bank of the river. 
at the same time. The frog's about to jump in, swim to the other side. Scorpion sees what's about to happen, engages the frog in conversation, and says, Mr. Frog, I'm a scorpion and I can't swim. Would you be so kind to let me hop on your back? You swim across the river, just deposit me on the other side. I'd be grateful. Frog looks at the scorpion and says, no way. Scorpions sting frogs and kill them. I'd get out there halfway, you'd sting me and I'd drown. Scorpion said, Mr. Frog, with your frog brain, you're not thinking. If I stung you out there halfway, you'd drown and I'd drown. I'm not interested in committing suicide. I just want to get to the other side. Please do me the favor. Frog says, okay, that makes sense. Hop on. Scorpion hops on the frog's back. The frog starts across the river. Sure enough, halfway across the river, the scorpion stings the frog. They're now both in the water about to go down for the third time. The frog cannot believe what's happened. And he said, why did you do that? I'm about to drown and die, but so are you. Why would you do that? And the scorpion said, because I am a scorpion. Make the note. You can't take a chance. You've got to know the scorpion. Chance. A lot of these subtle invitations that kids have at school. This is the scorpion and the frog story. It seems to be okay. The promises seem to be all right. And it turned out to be disaster. So you must learn the story of the frog and the scorpion. I learned in building an enterprise, there are some people you don't need their productivity. Better off without their productivity because they're scorpions in the fold. The old prophet said what? Beware of the foxes that spoil the vines. The vineyard looks good, but you better look a little closer. The foxes, the foxes, the foxes are at work. And to be a good shepherd, to be a good father, to be a good mother, you've got to learn the story of the frog and the scorpion and the foxes that spoil the vines. Okay, make these notes and we're through. I did a speech one time called Today I Am a Wealthy Man. Didn't have much to do with money, but let me give you the list and we're finished. I said, today I'm a wealthy man, number one, because of my heritage. All that I inherited that I didn't work for, it just I, I was blessed with it. One was my parents, one was my country. I was blessed by books I didn't write. I was blessed by libraries I didn't build. I was blessed by courts I didn't organize. I was blessed by airplanes and telephones. I'm blessed by all that. I didn't create it. I inherited it. I inherited a country that believed in democracy and freedom. I mean, once you start this list of heritage, it's just staggering. Next, I said I'm wealthy because of my experiences. We even use the expression, he has a wealth of experience. Experience is wealth. It's commodity, it's coin, it's currency. And if you'll use your experience, it's, it's fortune making. Next, I said I'm wealthy because of my friends. Friends make you rich because of their support system. I just lost a friend, David, at 53. He was the friend I used to talk about. If I was stuck in some foreign jail, accused unduly, I would call David. Why? He would come and get me. That's a friend, right? No question that. Just come and get you. That's a friend. Now, we've all got casual friends who would say, hey, if you get back, call me. <laughs> and, and we'll get together. But we need those two. We need them all. Next, I said I'm wealthy because of my knowledge. Those that have passed their knowledge on to me has made me rich beyond belief. Here's what I asked for one time, a long time ago, unusual awareness. I want to be sensitive to what's happening, unusual awareness. Not only the gift of knowledge, but what's happening, what's going on, so that I can use my knowledge to the best of my ability. I only asked of my daughters two things, that's all. My daughters, I only asked two things. Here are those two things. Number one, the highest respect for all life. Number two, unusual kindness. That's all I ask. The highest respect for all life and unusual kindness. That'll take you anywhere. Next, I'm a wealthy man because of my future. I have the pledge of goods and services of people you wouldn't believe doing business around the world. Mega billions. You can imagine the extraordinary life I live. It's, it's unbelievable. And the pledge of goods and services, the pledge of help and assistance, the pledge of camaraderie, the pledge of whatever. See, Mr. Owen, what else would you like to do? We'll just go do it. You know, you want to 
build your own country, we'll do that. I mean, you know, whatever you want, we'll just go do. Can you imagine what that feels like? Whatever you want to do, there's plenty of resources all around the world to just go do it. That, that is so staggering. It's just unbelievable for me. Next, I want to leave you with this little challenge. Number one, let others lead small lives, but not you. Let your life not be just acceptable, but memorable. Let others cry over small hurts, but not you. Let others waste their resources, but not you. And then here's two more, and I'm finished. Learn to help people with their lives, not just their jobs. We need to teach job skills, yes. But if you'll also teach life skills, weave it all in to the teaching of job skills. Teach your children job skills, but then teach them life skills. And here's the last, my challenge for you. It comes from the old prophet. Here's what he said. If you work on your gifts, if you work on your abilities, if you work on your skills, if you work on your gifts, they will make room for you. They will make a place for you. If you become attractive, you'll have an attractive place. If you work on your skills, they will put you in an unusual place. You don't have to worry about the place. It is right now being prepared for you to qualify. The place. And if you work on your gifts, gifts of language, gifts of intelligence, gifts of faith, gifts of helping others, gifts of influence, if you'll work on those gifts, you'll always have a place. I got to be one of the great examples. Look where my gifts have brought me to this place. I worked hard on my gifts. I worked hard on my skills. I worked hard on my delivery. I worked hard on my ability to affect other people with language and words and experiences. And then my gifts brought me to unique places now around the world. A unique place in Australia, a unique place in South Africa, a unique place in Bangkok, a unique place in Singapore. You name the country and the city. Unique places I've had. Because my gifts, I worked on my gifts and made myself valuable enough to be invited to these places. The same thing is going to happen for you, without a doubt. So, I now leave here, but uh, I have a promise. I will not leave you behind. I'll take you with me in my heart and in my thoughts. God bless.